of our new leaf. The word repent means a change of mind. In the Greek, it's metanoia. So what does that mean? When John the Baptist came on the scene in Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2, as the forerunner of Christ, his message preached in the gospel of the kingdom was repent, Israel. And he only went to Israel and he only baptized Israel. And it was not a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It was the baptism of repentance and it was part of the Jewish mikvah in regards to the priesthood. And the Jews understood that. <clears throat> but it was repent for the kingdom of heavens at hand, the earthly millennial kingdom. Hey, Bren. That was promised to Israel. To repent is fine. To make a covenant with your repentance is how you do. <laughs> David, you need to stick around and listen because you're all me messed up on your understanding of Scripture and salvation. <clears throat> but the message they were preaching that John the Baptist was preaching was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The earthly millennial kingdom that will be fulfilled in the future where Christ will return at his second coming, not the rapture of the body of Christ, but at his second coming and establish his throne through the Davidic covenant to rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. And Israel will become a kingdom of priests that's what Moses said in Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6 God told him to tell the children of Israel that you'll become a kingdom of priests a holy nation a peculiar people and that promise will be fulfilled and Israel understood that so when they came along after after centuries of reading the writings of the prophets of this coming kingdom, the majority of your Bible is about that kingdom. Uh, not much, Mike. <clears throat> so they were preaching to repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Jesus, that was John the Baptist in Matthew, in Matthew 3. In Matthew 4, verse 17 and 23, Jesus was preaching repent for the kingdom. Hey, Dad was preaching repent for the kingdom of heavens at hand the same earthly millennial kingdom Israel needed to repent Jesus was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel his entire earthly ministry was to Israel alone and when he came on on the scene he was during his earthly ministry it was still Old Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the, not the first four books of the New Testament. They're the last four books of the Old Testament because Hebrews 9, 15 to 17 is crystal clear that there cannot be a New Testament without the death of the testator, not the birth of the testator, the death of the testator. Galatians 4, 4 says that, that he was born under the law. He kept the law, he taught the law. He made the law more inward and about the heart. When he healed a, a leper, he told him to go make an offering at the temple. He was, he was born and lived as a Jew and was, had come in, hey, mercy, mercy came a-running. And he was, uh, thanks for the follow, Yale Miko. Um, they were offering the kingdom to Israel. And then Matthew 15, 24, like I said, said that Jesus was not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His earthly ministry was to only to Israel. And he made a couple of exceptions of helping, like he healed the Syrophoenician woman um, whose daughter was possessed by a devil and she came to him and he saw her faith and and everything but his whole ministry was to Israel and offering the kingdom to them and when he sent out the disciples in Matthew chapter 10 he gave them power over devils disease death because 
Jesus went about, Matthew 4, 23 says that Jesus went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness. The physical healing took place as part of the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. And it was because they're promised to become a kingdom of priests. So they had to be water baptized. They had to be a physical specimen, just like in Leviticus 21, it lays out that a priest could not be blind, maimed, lame, have leprosy, or have a devil, whatever. So they were healing. Jesus began preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness, Matthew 4, 23. <clears throat> when he sent out the disciples in Matthew 10, he gave them power over disease, devils, and everything, and said, Go sent them out preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and he said, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, because the kingdom was being offered to Israel, the ones that to whom it was promised. The old covenant was made with Israel, and the new covenant is made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, because the kingdoms are split. But Ezekiel prophesies that the, with the stick of Ephraim and the stick of Judah that the kingdoms will be reunited at the second coming of Christ when he gathers together his elect from around the world and brings them back into that land that was promised to them when he rules and reigns and Israel goes in to become that kingdom of priests. And the folks that are going in during Daniel's 70th week, after the body of Christ is gone, God resumes his dealings with Israel for seven final years, the time of Jacob's trouble. And he will bring... Hey, Shannon. Hope you're doing well. That he was bringing in... the, the There's a seven final years where God resumes his dealings with Israel in their last days where he will judge and and basically take out over two-thirds of them, the ones that are in Jerusalem when the Antichrist um, desecrates the temple and declares himself as God at the abomination of desolation halfway through that period. Jesus told him in Matthew 24, when you see that happen, flee to the mountains of Judea. Get out of town, hightail it. And there's a place in the wilderness that he's going to keep them safe for the final 42 months. And at the second coming, those that endure to the end, the same will be saved. Those that don't take the mark and all Israel will be saved. Romans 11, Paul talks about it. They're blind in part right now. It was a mystery revealed to Paul that Israel's blind in part until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. I'm glad you caught Shannon. I'm, I didn't, I don't think I shared the live with you. Um, but God's not finished with Israel. And after the body of Christ is caught up to be together with the Lord and taken out of here before God resumes his dealings with Israel, the body of Christ was a mystery revealed to Paul and there's no Jew or Gentile in the body of Christ. So whether you're of Israel descent, of the 12 tribes today, or a Gentile, born a Gentile, doesn't make any difference. There's one gospel, which I'll get to, that when you get into the body of Christ, in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male or female, bond or free. But <clears throat> but he sent them out, the disciples in, in Matthew 10, preaching the same message to Israel only, go not in the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the house of Israel. And he preached, he was preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. The same message John the Baptist and Jesus were preaching. And that repent in the gospel of the kingdom, repent dealt with Israel believing that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. That's why the gospel of John was written. He said in John 20, 31, he said that, 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 that he wrote that gospel, it's called the Gospel of John, uh, but he wrote that 
that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, is what he said. That was the cross. It was not to believe in the coming death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for their sins and being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and being baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit and sealed until the day of redemption. The body of Christ, like I said, was a mystery revealed to Paul. So they're preaching to Israel, repent, Israel, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. But they rejected Christ specifically because they had to repent as a nation and become the born-again nation that was prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 66, 7, and 8. And Jesus told Nicodemus when it was just him and Nicodemus, just one, one man, and he told, said, ye must be born again. Ye is you all, plural. Israel, you must be born again. But not all Israel is Israel meaning only some of Israel is Israel. It doesn't mean you're Israel. Not all of Israel is Israel, meaning the believing remnant of Israel, those that believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so they sent them out preaching that message. And when they came back to Jesus, that was Matthew 10. When they came back to Jesus at the coast of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked them, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? How'd it go, fellas? I sent you out and said, Go not in the way of the Gentiles and preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. And if they don't accept, shake the dust off your feet, go to the next town. And they went out preaching that when they came back. He said, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets, all the wrong answer. And he says, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter steps forth and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That was the right answer. And he said, blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonas, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father which is in heaven. That was the repentance that Israel needed. It was not to believe in his coming death, burial, and resurrection. And we know that because in Mark 9, 30 to 32, and Luke 18, 31 to 34, when it was time for him to go to the cross, he said, it's time for me to go die. And in Matthew 16, Peter rebuked him, said, be it far from thee, Lord. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan, Pope Peter. And in Mark 9, 30 to 32, when he told him that, it says that they were afraid to ask, they didn't understand. And in Luke 18, 31 to 34, he said specifically, it's time for me to go die and be raised on the third day. That sounds an awful lot like our gospel today that, that, that was revealed to Paul that we must believe. After three years of ministry with Jesus and following Jesus, which is what he meant when he said, take up a cross and follow me, he literally follow me and they dropped their nets and followed him. We can't follow Jesus physically in the way that Jesus was referring to, to the disciples. And when he said, take up your cross, that meant count the cost, because it could cost your life following me, and it did. They were all martyred, some of them on a cross. And so they're preaching that message. And in Luke 18, 31 to 34, he says, it's time for me to go die and be raised on the third day. And you would think that if they were preaching, hey, believe that Jesus Christ is going to die on the cross for your sins, be buried and raised again on the third day. If you believe that, put your faith and trust in Christ. You'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ and sealed in the day of redemption. It's not what it what they responded it says and they did not understand these things were hid from them the message of salvation was different the audience was different and I want to preface by saying that nobody from Adam to the last person born into this world can have eternal life and be justified and forgiven of their sins and have their sins washed away taken away apart from the blood of Christ 
and his death, burial, and resurrection, but what people were required to preach as the gospel of salvation and what was expected of people to believe and do absolutely changed throughout time. So after Jesus went up before the, the religious leaders in Matthew 23, and they were rejecting him. And he said in Matthew 23, 13, he says, you're not only preventing yourselves from going into the kingdom, you're preventing everybody else. It required for the kingdom to come. Jesus told him, when you pray, our father, our Israel's father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Israel understood that. Gentiles today think that they try to go in and spiritualize the whole thing and think, well, we're Israel now and we're praying for a kingdom to come. And that's not our heaven. That's not our destination. The body of Christ has a home eternal in the heavens. We are, if you're saved, you are seated in heavenly places already and your bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh a member of the body of Christ which is the fellowship of the mystery apart meaning it's apart from going through Israel like Gentiles in times past had to do and get circumcised and go and put themselves under the law and participate in the day of atonement and all those things with an earthly paradise by the way awaiting an earthly kingdom but the body of Christ is heavenly with a heavenly destination. And we're seated in heavenly places because he is seated in heavenly places and we are in Christ. So Jesus, after his death, burial, and resurrection, they didn't believe that he had resurrected. He, in fact, he, he, it was shown to women first, Mary and everybody, and they had to go tell the the disciples and in John 21 I believe is where it says that they went and they didn't believe so they wanted to go check it out for themselves so we know that they even after Jesus said I'm going to be raised on the third day if they believed that for their salvation and believed that he would be raised on the third day they would have been watching their watches or sundials on their wrists Three days, three nights, you know. We know he's going to resurrect, but but they didn't believe. And then they went, and after his death, burial, and resurrection, he spent 40 days with the disciples, with the 11, because Matthias had not been rock, paper, scissored in yet to replace Judas. And he spent 40 days with them, Luke 24 says, taking them through the, the, all of the Tanakh, Genesis through Malachi, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. That's Genesis through Malachi, showing everything in there concerning him. All of the prophecies that were pointed at him that Israel did not understand. And he's teaching them where like David said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's pointing to me. When it says that he'll not suffer his holy one to seek corruption, that's about me and my resurrection. When it says, when God told Satan in the Garden of Eden, told the serpent that, that the, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman and the seed of the woman will bruise the seed of the serpent and you'll bruise his heel. And that was, thank you for the share, shares, Miriam. And that was pointing to me, the first prophecy pointing to me. And he took them for 40 days and showed them everything in Scripture in the Old Testament, the Tanakh, because Genesis is not Old Testament. That's before. The Old Testament doesn't begin until the middle of Exodus when the law was given to Israel. And so he takes them through 
and tells them and gives them the commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing, water baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, beginning in Jerusalem. And he told him to wait in Jerusalem until you be endued from power on high. And guess what? Because Israel continued to reject Christ after the resurrection, they never successfully even got out of the area of Jerusalem. And he told them to go and preach the gospel to every creature, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And those that believe in Mark 16, those that believe and are baptized will be saved. Those that believe not will be damned. And these signs will follow those that believe. They'll be able to speak in tongues and, and heal the sick and take up serpents and drink liquid plumber and all those things and not be harmed. Specific uh, signs that deal with Daniel's 70th week, they're not just happenstance so that some people in West Virginia go around snake handling and run up and down the aisles and getting bit and dying. It was because the it was going to protect the believers going into Israel's last days, there's gonna be locusts that are going to go out with the tails of scorpions that'll sting like serpents. And it will not unalive them. They'll want to be unalive, but they'll be alive for five months in pain. They'll be protected from that. There's gonna be wormwood poisoning the water. They'll be protected from that because it says that you can drink anything and not be harmed. That's not our period of time. That's dealing with the last days for Israel. And they said, he said, those that believe and are baptized will be saved. Those that believe not will be damned. Still preaching the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. And Peter did just that. They, got, they waited to be endued from power from on high. And Jesus baptized them with the Holy Ghost like John the Baptist said he would in Matthew 3.11 when he said, I indeed baptize with water, but there's coming one after me who will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You do not want the baptism of fire, Pentecostals. That's judgment. Read the very next verse after that. And it's dealing with judgment in the last days. But Jesus baptized them with the Holy Ghost at Pentecost, which is different than the baptism for us today. Paul said that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism in Ephesians 4, 5. And he tells you what that is in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. He says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, the body of Christ that was a mystery revealed to Paul Jesus baptized them with the Holy Ghost at Pentecost and, at, and, and, and thereafter for Israel and the Gentile proselytes. That's different than the baptism today. And so they, Peter obeyed, he went and preached at Pentecost and said, ye men of Israel, you crucified the Messiah. It was not good news about the cross. He was not glorying in the cross like we do today. He didn't even mention cross. In fact, the word cross isn't even in the book of Acts. It's referred to as a tree. The preaching of the cross began with the apostle Paul, which I'm getting to. But he said, you crucified the Messiah. And they were pricked at the hearts and said, well, what do we need to do? And he says, repent, be baptized for the remission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that's exactly what the commission was given to them, which is a different commission than what we have today in this as ministers of reconciliation and ambassadors for Christ. And he told them, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, every one of you, for the remission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
those that did that, again, the repent is to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, not to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection for their sins and being baptized by the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. It was still preaching the kingdom. The kingdom in Acts 1, before he ascended, the apostles were talking to him and asked him, Lord, will this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Because they're waiting for the kingdom. It was They've been preaching about it for three years. It was promised going all the way back to the prophets and everything. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. That was the message they were preaching, was the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. And so they continued doing that and said, sell everything you have in Acts 2, which nobody ever preaches that. Nobody preaches, go not in the way of the Gentiles. Nobody preaches, tell no man from this day forward, I'm the Christ. The red letters if you will. And the reason why they were selling everything is because in the kingdom, all their needs are going to be met. He's going to give them, give us this day our daily bread. And that's what's going to happen. He's going to give them in the kingdom when they become a kingdom of priests, that he's going to give them um, their daily bread. So they had to be, as priests, they had to be water baptized. They had to be anointed with oil, which was Jesus baptizing them with the Holy Ghost and sprinkled with blood, which is the cross. Again, nobody from Adam to the last person can have their sins taken away and, be, and receive eternal life apart from the blood of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. But the message they were preaching was not, believe this and believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, become a member of the body of Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit in the day of redemption, which is the rapture, and go to heaven when you die. That's not what they were preaching. It was about the kingdom of heaven, which is the earthly millennial kingdom. And they, they, were, they, they had preached that message for a year after the death, burial, and resurrection. And the reason... They were, it was, Jesus told them a parable of the fig tree with the husbandman coming to the vineyard three years in a row. And the fig tree didn't bear fruit. And he said, cut it down. And he said, give it one more year. And then if it doesn't bear fruit, then cut it down. Three years of them rejecting Christ in his earthly ministry. And they were given one more year. And that probationary period that was given to them concluded with the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7. They reject, they stumbled at the stumbling stone, which was Christ. By rejecting Christ, they were denying the Father, according to Jesus, Father, Son, and then Holy Ghost filled Stephen, gets stoned to death in Acts 7, strike one, strike two, strike three, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and then it says Israel fell and began their diminishing and then Paul later says that they are now blind in part until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. <clears throat> That's Acts 7. Acts 8, 1, the believing remnant of Jews are scattered into Judea, Samaria, and Gentile lands, which is why James is written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, and 1 Peter's written to the Jews scattered in Gentile lands like Bithynia and Cappadocia and Asia and 1 John is writing to Israel in the last days. In the, this is the last time, 1 John 2, 18, that Antichrist has come. This is the last time, he says it twice, dealing with Israel in their last days. And Jude and Revelation, the Hebrew, and Hebrews written to Hebrews. So the Hebrew epistles are dealing, addressed to Israel that we get a lot of doctrine from. We can understand a lot of things, especially Hebrews as it relates to the, like I mentioned earlier, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we know are the last four books of the Old Testament because the um, Hebrews 9, 15 to 17 says there cannot be a New Testament without the death of the testator, not the birth of the testator, the death. So Christ's earthly ministry was under the law and only to Israel. 
and they were preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So they were scattered in Acts 8, verse 1. Acts eleven nineteen says that, that those that were scattered only preached to Israel and to Jews, still preaching the gospel of the kingdom, believing repent, which is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, they're scattered, and then Acts 9, God finds a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus after the fall and diminishing of Israel, finds a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus on his way to Damascus, and he calls him to become the apostle to the Gentiles and begins revealing the mysteries to him like the mystery of the body of Christ, the mystery of the rapture, the fellowship of the mystery, the the mystery that blindness and parts happen to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and all these things in an entirely new ministry and he gave him the dispensation of the grace of God to us. It began something new. Paul was the, the chief of sinners when it came to the body of Christ. Not that he's the worst sinner, but that he was the first one into the body of Christ. In 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, and that, he, there, there, that, that God began demonstrating his long suffering through Paul as, as the, uh, a pattern for those that, that would believe thereafter. So we're living in a, in, in a period of time, the, the, the church age, the dispensation of grace, whatever you wanna call it, meaning that this is the period of time where all, including Gentiles, do not have to go through Israel. We don't have to go through their land, laws, or covenants. The old, Like I said earlier, the old covenant was given to Israel through Moses, and the new covenant's promised to the same people. Same people the Old Testament was promised to. He says in Jeremiah 31, um, 31 to 34, and Hebrews 8, 8 through 11. Hey, can you guys mute the preterists? No, Nero's not the Antichrist, and the, the Millennial Kingdom is still future. Um, and so, uh, I lost my train of thought. So the the um, oh, so we don't the Hebrews eight eight through eleven and Jeremiah thirty one thirty one to thirty four says, "Behold, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah." because the kingdoms are split, like I said. But they will be reunited at the second coming of Christ in their one kingdom of Israel and be a kingdom of priests and all those things that I already talked about. Um, <clears throat> the fellowship of the mystery, Paul said in Ephesians 3, 9, that we're to make all men see what, what is the fellowship of the mystery. That's it. It's becoming a member of his body, not going through Israel, and their land law and covenants, but having direct access and being made nigh to God through the blood of Christ and becoming part of the one new man. God is making of twain today of both Jew and Gentile, one new man, where there is no Jew or Gentile in the body of Christ. It is the new creature, not part of the born again nation that'll be f fulfilled at the second coming along with the new covenant being fulfilled as promised as as they go into, into the kingdom. But why, why was all of that kept, mis why were all those mysteries kept hidden in God? A mystery in scripture is not Sherlock Holmes. A mystery is wisdom hidden in God, according to 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. And this is important to get the reason why the body of Christ, which like I said, has a home eternal in the heavens, there's no Jew or Gentile in the body of Christ, it's fellowship of the mystery, the gospel that we must believe today that was revealed to Paul. He said in Galatians 1, 11, 12, the gospel I preached, I didn't receive it of men, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. He defines it in Romans 1 16 for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation and he lays out what that gospel is in summary in 1 Corinthians 15 1 through 4 he says moreover brethren 
I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, this gospel he received from Jesus Christ after his ascension, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and rose again the third day, and putting your faith and trust in Christ alone, being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and being baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ and sealed until the day of redemption. That's the gospel that all must believe today to be saved. It's not repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. It's not repent for the kingdom of heavens at hand. It's to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his shed blood and his imputed righteousness through our faith alone, apart from works. James is written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Like I said earlier, just like 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation, and Hebrews. The body of Christ doctrines found in Paul's epistles during this church age, meaning church, the church which is his body, the body of Christ, were sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, which is the rapture. That's when we're sealed until. If you miss the rapture, you cannot be sealed by the Holy Spirit into the day of redemption because the day of redemption is already passed and you have to endure to the end of the seven-year period like Jesus told him in Matthew 24. Those that endure to the end, the same will be saved. They go back to the gospel of the kingdom, Jesus said as well in Matthew 24. Because guess what? The focus is on Israel and they need to repent, mean believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand again. They're in the last days prior to the second coming and the establishment of the promised earthly kingdom to them. <clears throat> but why was it, why was all that kept secret? Paul said about his gospel in Romans 16, 25, he said, now to him this power to establish you according to my gospel, the one that was revealed to him that I just went through, revealed to him by Jesus Christ. And he says, now to him is the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, not just according to prophecy, but according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret since the world began. Why was all that kept secret since the world began? What Peter was preaching after, even after the cross, he said in Acts 3, 19 to 21, that it was what was spoken by the prophets since the world began. Paul said that his gospel was according to the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret since the world began. Why was it kept secret since the world began? The six days of creation. Like I mentioned earlier, Genesis 3.15, God told the serpent that I'll put enmity between you and the woman and that her seed will bruise your head and you'll bruise his heel and everything. Satan had already fallen and wanted to exalt his throne above the stars of God and to be like the Most High. And he wanted the dominion of the earth and the heaven. He wanted to take full possession of both heaven and earth and he already had his plans with the spiritual wickedness in high places, going before God as the accuser of the brethren and everything, wanting to take the dominion of the earth. Good night, Kathleen. Or are you saying good night to McGuck? Good night, McGuck. Um, so he, that, that was what Satan's plan was and through the writings of the prophet he knew about the kingdom Adam was given dominion over the earth and he blew it but the second Adam is going to come and he's going to establish full dominion over this earth which Adam failed to do he knew about that and what was 
prophesied in, in relation to the Lord Jesus taking dominion of the earth. But he didn't know anything about God's plan for reconciling the heavens, which is the body of Christ, the fullness of him, with a home eternal in the heavens, and God's plan by keeping this mystery hidden of the body of Christ and what, what our heavenly vocation is. Yeah, he's called the second Adam. And so Satan wanted to destroy that seed for generations, for thousands of years. He tried to destroy that seed. Even at the yeehaw, even at the firstborn, you know, uh, the, the, the babies, boys that were born in, near Bethlehem and all that stuff, just doing everything he can to destroy a seed. And then after that seed came and he was born into this world, God in the flesh, the eternal son of God, the word became flesh. And he wanted him on that cross. He thought, if I can get him up on that cross, and unalive him, I win. That was his plan. He possessed Judas even to betray him and get him on that cross. But as the prince of the power of the air and the, and the one who directed and influenced the, the princes of this world and all the religious leaders and the kings and the princes and everything, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 6 through 8 tells us he says I, that we speak this in a mystery, the hidden wisdom of God, not hidden and searchable in the scriptures, but hidden wisdom in God revealed later to the apostle Paul. And he says in verse eight of 1 Corinthians two, that if the princes of the world had known, including the prince of the power of the air, what was gonna happen as a result of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and the formation of the body of Christ, and all these things that were kept hidden in God, it says in verse 8 that if the princes of the world, including the prince of the power of the air, had known that they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So when Satan got up on got Jesus up on that cross, he thought he won, and like I always say, it was the ultimate Uno reverse card on Satan. He thought he won, and Jesus accomplished the primary reason why he came, was to die on that cross and shed his blood and be resurrected so that we could be saved. And that the body of Christ would begin later with the Apostle Paul and the home eternal in the heavens being seated in heavenly places and all the things that was talking about in reconciling the heavens. Satan had no clue and neither did the disciples, like I said, in Luke 18, 31 to 34, Mark 9, 30 to 32, Matthew 16, 21 to 23, and all those other passages, that because they were preaching the gospel of the kingdom of Israel, they, they, had, they had no idea when he said, it's time for me to go die and be raised on the third day. It says they did not understand and the saying was hidden from them. And so that was why the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God, believing that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day, being justified by his blood and resurrection. And Paul said that in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that God hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the righteousness that you need in order to be justified in the sight of God, to be made righteous in the sight of God, is his righteousness, not yours, not your law keeping. Gentiles were never under the law to begin with, not your water baptism today, not your, you know, being part of some false religion like the mother church in Rome, some cult with an aberrant Jesus like the Mormons and JWs and all the rest of it. Um, it's, it's only 
It's only through Christ believing that he did that for you personally. The blood of goats and bulls provided remission of sin under the Israel law and Levitical system. Roman Hebrews 9.22 says, talking about the blood of goats and bulls, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. But he also says that the blood of goats and bulls cannot take away sins. They were provided a temporary forgiveness and remission, but only the blood of Christ can wash away sins. And even in Acts 3, 19 to 21, Peter was preaching to the religious leaders in the temple, and he says, repent, after he gave them the same murder indictment that he gave the men of Israel at Pentecost. He says, you killed the prince of life. And he says, repent, believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Not right then and there when you repent and are converted, but that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ. The second coming is when Israel's sins will be blotted out and the new covenant will be fulfilled through them and no man will have to tell their neighbor to know the Lord. They'll all know him. Israel's sins will be forgiven. And in Ezekiel 36 prophesies that, that they'll be given a new heart and a new spirit under this new covenant. And that his that uh, he'll write his law in their hearts and give them a new spirit, put a new spirit in them that will cause them to keep his judgments and statutes. That is an unction of the Holy Spirit we don't have in the body of Christ. We do not have the Holy Spirit causing us complete obedience. But Israel, under the new covenant, they will become that kingdom of priests, the born-again nation, and they will be the the blessing to the world that they were that they were promised going all the way back for the first time. Today we go to to Jews or to Israel and preach the one gospel that saves today. Believe that Jesus Christ is is the son of God and that he died on the cross for our sins that he was buried and raised on the third day and becoming a member of the body of Christ where there's no Jew or Gentile and being baptized by the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ and sealed into the day of redemption. That's the message that we preach to everybody today, Jew or Gentile. But once the day of redemption comes and the rapture of the body of Christ, when we're caught up, our adoption, Paul says that all the members of the body of Christ um, had been predestined to the unto the adoption in Ephesians 1 5 and he defines it in Romans chapter 8 in verse 15 I believe he says we have the spirit of adoption but we're still in verse 23 waiting for the adoption to wit meaning namely or in other words the redemption of our bodies glorification that's the adoption that we're waiting for and that he goes on later in chapter 8 and says that we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son when we exchange our vile bodies unto, with, to a body like unto his we will be fully conformed to the image of his son as long as you're hauling this sinful carcass flesh around you're not in the image of the son of God you're not an image bearer either of God Adam was created in God's image but Nothing in scripture says that, that we're little image bearers running around today. Sin corrupted this human race and the world and death. But we'll be fully conformed to the image of his son when we receive our glorified bodies at the rapture and we stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ and then go on into the eternal state. And then the last thing, um, and this is so important. God's purpose through the earth, through Israel and prophecy. Prophecy always relates to Israel. 
It's always dealing with earth, with an earthly paradise and a future earthly kingdom. The body of Christ deals with mystery and is heavenly. But Paul, it, okay, it begins in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and earth. It concludes with, in Revelation 21, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and new Jerusalem, which is the bride of Christ, that holy city. The, body of, the church is not the bride of Christ, we're the body of Christ. New Jerusalem, the holy city, Revelation 21 is crystal clear as the bride of Christ. And Paul explains one of the mysteries is in Ephesians 1, he says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. The mystery, good night, Shannon, love you. The mystery, he says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. And in the next verse, he says, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, when all time ends, the times of the Gentiles, the times of Israel, the times of restitution, the millennial kingdom, all time when it ends, after the millennial kingdom, Satan's going to be loosed from the bottomless pit briefly and be destroyed at the Gog and Magog. And then this earth will be burned up, heaven will be destroyed, there'll be a new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. So he says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. It was the mystery real to Paul that he records for us to know is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times that he might gather together in one all things which are in heaven, the body of Christ, and the earth, Israel, and those that go in and inherit the kingdom of heaven, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, in him. It's all about Jesus. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, it's, it's laying everything out in God's plan to, to reconcile the heaven and earth and the purpose with the body of Christ and earth with Israel and their kingdom and all of that stuff. But when, it, when it's all said and done, he's going to gather together in one all things in Christ. And we become fellow citizens of, citizens of the household of God. Is what Paul says. Not the house of Israel or the house of Judah, but the household of God. The overarching kingdom of God that's made up of those that go into that earthly millennial kingdom of heaven and the body of Christ in the heavens. Amen, amen.